became a career firefighter with the Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Service, the chief of the medical division or EMS, the unofficial historian of the Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Service, over 65,000 digital images and newspaper articles, magazine articles, etc. Episode 24-9, 100 years, 1988. The Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Services, in collaboration with Cable 15, which at that time was the official cable channel of the Howard County government, uh, collaborated to do an excellent, excellent overview of the Howard County Fire Service and its rich history. 1888 was when the Elk City Volunteer Fire Department first started, and the video will take you from those humble beginnings up to where the department was in 1988. They recapped the first 100 years of the history of the Elkin City Volunteer Fire Department and the Howard County Department of Fire and Rescue Services. This piece was particularly well done and happy with the uh, overall results. On September 24, 1988, the Ellicott City Volunteer Firemen's Association celebrated its 100th anniversary. What started with a bucket brigade has grown into a Howard County Fire Department that encompasses 10 stations and over 500 men and women. Over the years, one goal has remained the same, service for others. County Fire Department is trained and ready to provide service for others. The history of Howard County's Fire Department is recorded with photos. Usually found in desk drawers or family albums, these pictures reveal the prideful expressions of the early firefighters as they stood next to the latest technology in fire suppression. These photos have also recorded the tragic side of being a firefighter. The deaths, the destruction, the displacement, the loss of a business. During a November evening in 1984, a six alarm blaze swept through the center of historic Ellicott City. Seven businesses and six apartments were destroyed. By morning, the devastation was more revealing. The worst fire in Ellicott City's history cost an estimated $1,300,000. It was to fight fires such as this that the original organizers established Howard County's first fire company. Today, the scarred structures of the 84 fire have been rebuilt, and several of the original owners have again set up shop. It is ironic that this fire occurred just down the street from Howard County's first firehouse. Volunteer Fire Company of Ellicott City Station 1 was built in 1889 to house the services of a hand-drawn ladder wagon. For 35 years, the station was used by the fire department, but as more people moved into Howard County, demand for increased fire protection also grew. The need for paid full-time firefighters was apparent. In 1959, the fire department hired its first paid firefighter. This created a new organized fire department, a marriage between volunteers and paid firefighters. To oversee this relationship is fire administrator Richard Shaw. The choice to work or volunteer in the fire service means that an individual has chosen one of two of the most hazardous occupations today. The scope of the firefighter's responsibility extends from responding to emergencies where they find the un unknown or the unknown exists to situations where the firefighter must maintain composure at all times while others have lost their complete emotion. Howard County is divided into six fire districts which are manned by both volunteers and career fire personnel. The desire to become a career firefighter usually begins from the influence of a family relative. One in particular had just gotten out of the military and was told by his father that a career existed for him in the Howard County Fire Department. He is Chief Deputy Martin Lepore. 
the people today are much more educated. They are extremely dedicated individuals. Uh, the people are, uh, again, highly motivated. Uh, they're constantly involved in training. They're constantly involved in trying to improve their skills and abilities so that they can better serve the citizenry of the county. To improve communication between the county's fire administration and the men and women in the field, Howard County Firefighters Association Local 2000 was recognized by the county in 1984. Benny Mullins is a firefighter first class and president of the union. He believes the goal of the union is to be an active participant within the department. I think that myself as the president of the local that the union is very important because they need somebody on the uh, labor side to at least look forward to the different positions of the county and uh, maintain with the rest of the people. So the union is important in the way that uh, we feel that somebody has to deal directly with the fire administrator and that's where our line is, it's direct communications with the fire administrator. Benny Mullins' interest in the fire service came about while visiting his brothers during their shift at the fire station. Prior to applying for a full-time position, Mullins had been a volunteer firefighter for five years. Unfortunately, most people believe that when you become a volunteer firefighter, you receive a stipend. In fact, these men and women use their free time to fight fires and rescue neighbors. Richard McCauley works for Howard County's Clerk of the Courts. As a volunteer firefighter, he takes a week's vacation during October to talk with elementary students about fire prevention. With the growth of the county, the old timers know that Howard County had volunteer firefighters. Uh, most of the people on Main Street knew we had a volunteer fire department with career men and we got recognized. Now as all the people move into Howard County from other areas where maybe they were just paid stations and career firefighters, all they know is they pick up the phone, they call 911 and help comes. So part of our goal in the association may be for a little more recognition, but that's low on the level because service is our primary concern. The typical boyhood fantasy of riding the big red engine is still a strong influence in joining the fire department. Richard McCauley grew up two blocks away from the Ellicott City Fire Station on Main Street. Besides being a lieutenant in the Volunteer Fire Service, he's also president of the Howard County Volunteer Firemen's Association. At any given time, the bells ring, the pagers go off, and volunteers respond to their respective stations to jump on the equipment and assist in the extinguishment or rescue operations that are necessary. The Volunteer Fire Service plays a vital role in the delivery of fire and emergency medical services to the Howard County community. They provide these services through the administration of facilities, through staffing of apparatus, and through management of emergency incidents. All these efforts uh, contribute toward a uh, savings to the taxpayers on an annual basis. Besides monetary savings, the true rewards come when houses and people are saved a common goal shared by both career and volunteer firefighters. I think most volunteers feel our goal and our purpose is service anytime, anywhere. A hurried call to 911 and an ambulance is dispatched to the address. 911. It's ready to work when someone's life is on the line, and it could be someone you love. Daddy gonna be okay. 911. Learn it and remember. This message is brought to you by CMP Telephone and your public safety agencies. We look for people who have good academic ability. We look for people who have good mechanical skills ability. We're looking for people who have leadership potential, people who demonstrate compassion, have an understanding of community, community relations, uh, demonstrate team, uh, the team concept, persons who are risk takers, persons who demonstrate enthusiasm and dedication, are physically fit, and people who, are, who indicate they have th their willingness to work with volunteers. It is day one for these new recruits of recruit class number five. Prior to 1984, all of Howard County's career firefighters were sent to other counties or jurisdictions for training. 
These 18 men and women are the fifth group to enter Howard County's training academy. Before becoming recruits, each one had to be screened to determine if they could stand the strain of the program. The physical agility test is probably the most difficult to pass. Physical training is not only important to recruits, career firefighters must also be certified physically fit each year by a similar test. A basic aptitude exam and psychological interview are also utilized to sift through the potential candidates. In 1988, 200 candidates participated in the first part of the screening. Out of the 82 who passed the first exam, 52 serious candidates showed up for the physical test. According to Deputy Chief James Heller, self-screenings help to whittle down the number of possible recruits. Uh, we're losing probably 30 percent at each step of the process and uh, those who finish the agility test then go to an interview panel which is the third and final phase uh, where they're questioned by a panel and evaluated in terms of their personal capabilities and attitudes and things like that which are very difficult to measure in, in a structured environment. And then we do background investigations and medical examinations uh, before we actually hire the individuals. Manager of Howard County's Services Bureau, Chief Heller has been in charge of the training division since 1974. According to Chief Heller, there are three types of men and women who become career firefighters. Those who have a background as a volunteer firefighter, those who are looking for a job because of the salary and benefits, and finally, those who are interested in a helping profession. Now down to 18, these recruits will go through four months of intensive training. Classroom lectures will total over 200 hours. What they learn in the classroom is then reinforced in the field. The philosophy of the training academy is to divide a recruit's time between instructional and practical experience. House fires and their suppressions are an important part of the training. Every year, academy instructors look for houses that are about to be torn down by developers or property owners. These owners save money by allowing the fire department to destroy the structures. Training division instructor, Lieutenant George Morgan, is actually trained to develop fires in a controlled environment. A, again, I can't emphasize that this training is, is very important for recruits to put the hands on and get the practical application. We wouldn't expect doctors or lawyers to go into courtrooms or operating rooms without having practice. The first fire that a recruit has nah, shouldn't nah. be their first fire. They should be you know, experienced in those through a friendly situation as we've developed here. The student who graduates from this is probably the best trained, at least in our opinion, uh, of any recruit program in the state. It's very comprehensive and very challenging. So we're very selective in who we hire here in the county. Training for the new recruits doesn't end at graduation. Firefighters and emergency medical technicians must be recertified periodically. Training at this level educates both career and volunteer firefighters. Volunteers must also be certified to operate and ride the equipment. I think it would just increase the quality service that's being given. Uh, it can only help to develop a better volunteer system by training them better. And by giving them good training, we hope to make it a safer system. Michael Faith started as a volunteer before being hired as a full-time firefighter. Now an instructor, Faith appreciates the life-saving value of a training class. Prior to this class, what we offered was a 72-hour basic firefighting class, which was offered through the Maryland Fire and Rescue Institute. In recent years, we've found the need to expand on that. And this year, in fact, this class is a pilot program for what we call a Firefighter II class. It meets the National Fire Protection Association's Firefighter II standards. It's been increased to 120 hours, which will better develop the firefighter to be able to function on the fire ground. And we are sort of on our own stepped out and said, we need to increase the training and we're going to do it. So our firefighters should come out much, much better prepared to do their job. Another advantage of training sessions is the development of rapport between the career firefighters and the volunteers. According to Michael Faith, such cooperation is a necessity if all firefighters want to stay alive. I hope they take with them the knowledge and ability to be able to function at the end of this class as a firefighter out in the system. Uh, even though they're volunteers, they ride right next to me on the fire engine. And if I can, I will train them to be the best firefighters that they can because it only helps me. 
During certain times, special training is required to introduce new techniques of handling emergencies. Again, both career and volunteer firefighters must rely on the team concept when, for example, extricating persons who are trapped in a vehicle. Volunteer Deputy Fire Chief Edward Burnage has seen his share of accidents. He knows what it takes to prevent a tragedy from occurring. Uh, time is of the essence, especially in trauma-related injuries. Um, shock trauma has developed over the years what we call the golden hour. From the time that that incident occurs, you've got virtually 60 minutes critical time which could uh, either deteriorate or improve the condition of the patient. Um, a technique like this we practice over and over. Uh, the first drill took with a, a bunch of firefighters that are new to this procedure. It took them 18 minutes. Uh, it takes them just a couple of minutes to get them out because we're already doing some steps in the process while the other crew is working on getting them out. Um, by the time we're done today, we'll have this uh, system down to about eight minutes. The time is crucial. New vehicle designs have created new problems for the fire department. Unfortunately, it takes an emergency to discover these problems. The old method we used to use is someone was trapped by a steering wheel or the dashboard was sitting upon their chest. Uh, normally, you hook a chain around the steering wheel, the other chain to the frame, and pull that steering wheel away from the newer cars now have what we call a knuckle in the steering wheel and that assembly, if you were to pull that up, it would impinge it back upon the patient. Um, this new method we're using, the firefighters will go ahead and open the car up, uh, gain access to the patient, we'll have someone inside with them, uh, and someone's trading in emergency medicine, we'll cover the patient with a blanket, protecting them from any glass or anything that might fall on them, um, reassuring the patient. You know, there's nothing that can happen to them. We're there. Everything's protected. And then the next move is we open the door up. After that, we make a series of cuts to the roof. After that's accomplished, we go to the other side, do the same thing, and then make a cut at the base. Using the ram, we virtually push the car apart, taking the dashboard, relieving the pressure off the chest or whatever extremities that it's uh, impinged on. The time that people have to volunteer is really diminishing. And President of Howard County's Volunteer Firemen's Association, Richard McCauley. We want higher levels of training. We want our people to be able to go out and function professionally. Uh, we feel that we're accomplishing that, but every day we try to add just a little bit to make the service a little bit better. To cover the 251 square miles of the county, Howard County's Fire and Rescue Service has, at present, 10 fire stations. These strategically located stations have cut the response time to a matter of minutes. These stations include Ellicott City Station 1. First organized in 1888, this station eventually became Station 2, Main Street, Ellicott City. Station 6 was built in 1937 in Savage, Maryland. Elkridge Station joined the department in 1942. 1944 brought a big change to Howard County's fire service, first with Station 3 in West Friendship, then Station 4 in Lisbon. Next, Station 5 was built in Clarksville in 1947. With the construction of Newtown Columbia, fire protection was also planned. Banneker Road Station 7 was built in 1969. As more people and companies settled in Ellicott City and Columbia, more stations were added. In 1974, Bethany Street Station 8 and Tamar Drive Station 9 were both placed in service. The last station was built in 1987, Rivers Park Station 10. But stations do not respond to emergencies. That's left up to the engines, the ambulances, and the crews who operate them. Richard Shaw is Howard County's fire administrator. Today's apparatus and equipment has improved greatly over the years. Uh, the technological advances uh, that we've seen have made our equipment better and safer for our people to use. Examples would be, we now provide enclosed cabs on our apparatus for firefighters who respond to emergencies. We also provide a breathing apparatus to all our personnel who work in unsafe environments. We're providing a complete protective gear for all our firefighters that presently meets a national standard. You've been through the pump class, this is your practical evolution of it. 
It's a reality. It's the same if you were sitting on a pump. What you practice here is what you're going to do on a fire, and that's the way we're going to operate it, okay? Any questions before we start? Howard County is a combination of urban and rural lifestyles. Training for the fire department means running the full gamut from learning to draft water from pumper trucks or fire ponds to operating large ladder trucks that reach multiple story buildings. Howard County firefighters, according to Chief Deputy Martin Lapore, must be ready for anything. I guess if you look at its location, you may not envision the, the Howard County Fire Department to be diverse. It sits uh, directly between two major metropolitan areas, one being Baltimore City and the other being Washington, D.C. But if you look more closely at our organization, you will see that it is extremely diverse. This is a pretty difficult thing for us at times because it means that we have to train our people in many different concepts in dealing with emergencies. Uh, we have to, on one hand, deal with a, a barn fire, which means there is no immediate water available except from a static water supply, a pond or a stream. So we have to draft our water to provide a water supply to deal with the emergency. And it may be not more than 30 or 40 minutes later we're dealing in an area that has a metropolitan water supply. We're dealing with hydrants. So our concepts and our strategies and our tactics are constantly changing. And one individual, or all individuals, have to be uh, adequately trained, both career and volunteer, to deal with the diversification. Uh, on the emergency medical services side, uh, uh, in some areas, it's, it's not unusual to have a, a vehicle accident involving two tractors, or to have a vehicle accident involving a tractor and farm machinery which is a lot different than two tractor trailers or two automobiles. So we are an extremely diversified uh, county, and I think that adds additional stress on our people, but that's also one of the, the pluses. There's always a little change happening in one's career, and that adds for enjoyment, too. Often hidden behind most fire departments is the EMS, or the Emergency Medical Service. Howard County's own division is sometimes dwarfed by images of the larger fire engines and receives little notice from the public. However, in the last 25 years, the EMS has stepped to the forefront. Commander Donald Howe is in charge of the division and has seen his share of calls during his 20 years of service. This fire was called into the 911 emergency phone line about 1.40 in the morning. Commander Howe left his wife and three daughters in the safety of their home in Lisbon and ventured out into the night. What awaited, he did not know. It's never routine when the call comes in. One simply responds. When the first unit arrived, six of the eight occupants had escaped the flames. Both firefighters and emergency medical technicians entered the burning structure to find the last two children who were still inside. Uh, they were both brought out to the exterior. Uh, basic and advanced life support skills were uh, initiated uh, to try to resuscitate both individuals who were in cardiac arrest at that time. Uh, they were subsequently transported over to Howard County General Hospital where those efforts were continued for approximately another 45 minutes until it was decided that uh, further efforts would be of, of, of no value. The emergency medical service has changed since the early days of basic life support care. In its infancy, the service started with an ambulance driver and a technician who could provide only CPR or oxygen to the patient. The veterans of that era affectionately label it as the swoop and scoop days. Today, the service has expanded to include cardiac rescue technicians. These new technicians are trained and licensed to give immediate medical attention to emergency victims. Besides basic life support care, the technicians can administer certain drugs and go as far as interpreting heart rhythms and defibrillate a patient by using the shock paddles. Uh, our, our goal is to, pro to provide the best service, emergency medical services, to the citizens of, of Howard County. And for us to accomplish that, uh, uh, we'd like to uh, typically dispatch our closest unit to the scene of the medical emergency. And once we get there, evaluate and treat the patient accordingly. And then to immediately transport that patient to the closest appropriate facility. And then by doing that, it allows us to get back in service as quickly as possible. We like to minimize our out-of-service time on an incident and maximize our in-service time. And uh, it's with that awareness that we're looking at uh, the entire population to accomplish that goal. Before the ambulances can roll out of the station, directions and street addresses must be given to the responding crews. This vital information is sent from central communication located in the administrative offices of the fire department. This center receives all emergency calls and through tonal signals dispatches units in proximity to the scene. Phones and station bells have been replaced with computers and high-frequency transmitters. Trained dispatchers man the center, putting in 12-hour shifts. 
Sometimes calls for help ring off the hook. Other times, duty is light and the phones are silent. David Wise is in charge of Central Communication. The tour starting with the 8 p.m., it all depends upon the day of the week and the weather again. Uh, starting at an 8 p.m. on a Friday night or a Saturday night uh, tends to be a little more hectic than starting on a, uh, a Sunday night or a Monday night. Uh, if it's a, a cold, windy night uh, in February, the, the Sunday night is uh, it's relaxing. There's not much occurring as compared to uh, a Sunday night uh, in August, particularly late in August when people are returning from um, barbecues and vacations and such, there's more activity out on the streets and there's more chance for services to be needed through here. When countywide emergencies occur, such as hurricanes, floods, and radioactive or chemical leaks, the Department of Emergency Management and Civil Defense is called upon to take charge of any disaster. Deputy Director of Emergency Management and Civil Defense is Murray Rommel. Uh, our role coordinates the efforts of all these agencies, and most people think it would just be government, but it's not. The Red Cross would come under a purview, also a Hammett radio operator group uh, called RACES, the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. These people also work for us, not only in a disaster, but we employ them in, in exercises monthly, and then one big one every year. So it's a, it's a coordination role of everything we have in this county, both public and private, to alleviate the effects of any type of disaster. The diversity of Howard County's fire department doesn't end with equipment, training, and personnel. The department tries to stop tragedies before they happen. The role of the Fire Prevention Bureau is to inspect and enforce all fire codes. Through the inspection of businesses and homes, emergency plans and procedures can be written up to ensure safety. Fire prevention is also taught in the schools. October is National Fire Prevention Month, and Howard County's Fire Department sets aside a week to visit each of the 26 elementary schools in the county. The philosophy of the program is to educate children at an early age so they can recall that information later in life. In charge of the Fire Prevention Bureau is Commander Edgar Schilling. I guess early on in the fire service, people became interested because they, they wanted to fight fires. They enjoyed the excitement. Uh, now a lot of people are involved in the fire service and public education because they enjoy working with children and they want to do something to address the fire problem that involves children. I guess probably one of the hardest things for a firefighter is to take care of a child who has been burned. So the interest is there you know, for the, the firefighters to stop this from happening. A major goal with presenting the equipment and different apparatus to elementary students is to remove the fear of the firefighter who has come to their rescue. The children, however, are not the only ones who learn from this experience. I really enjoy getting out and talking with the children. I don't do it too much anymore because the local station firefighters take care of it. But I guess, although you may never really know, there's sort of a personal satisfaction that somewhere in the years to come you may have helped save a, a child from either serious burn injuries or even death uh, through the public education programs. When friends don't stop friends from drinking and driving. Friends die from drinking and driving. Friends die from drinking and... Drinking and driving can kill a friendship. To work as a Howard County firefighter or emergency medical technician is a lot different from the typical 9 to 5 job. As career men and women, they work 24-hour shifts from 7 in the morning to 7 the next morning. When their shift is over, they have two days off and then go back on duty. Such a schedule requires a strong commitment, according to Chief Deputy Martin Lapore. Everybody, I guess, has a little boy or a little girl in them, and they're, they're looking to, I guess, challenge themselves and work in a very, very serious or dangerous situation and come out uh, being successful almost in your own eyes. You're a hero, I guess, at that point in time. 
and uh, that's what what drives me to be successful and it also drives me uh, from the standpoint of being able to help the citizens of Howard County and in many cases they're my personal friends or relatives. Once a firefighter is hired full-time he soon discovers that 80 to 85 percent of his time will be spent for non-emergency duties. There are no typical days in the fire department. Station crews must be ready at any time to respond when the tonal alarms are sounded. However, after they arrive and sign in for work, they must complete a work management program. The requirements of the program include physical fitness training or some level of calisthenics. From there, they are to do some actual training. To keep their skills refined, the crews train every day on some facet of the job, whether it be emergency medical service, rescue, or fire suppression. Maintenance of the apparatus and station is another required element of the program. They must make sure that the equipment they use on the scene doesn't break down or cost the life of a patient. With the rapid development of Howard County, all fire personnel are also required to go out on the street and acquaint themselves with the new areas being constructed within their fire districts. In our county, so our people have to go out, uh, they have to know where the new streets are, they have to know the, the different kinds of construction, uh, the numbers of people that will be living in any one area so that they can properly do their job. That's pretty much from a non-emergency standpoint. From an emergency standpoint, the day-to-day -day, uh, operation is, uh, is not well defined. We never truly know when an emergency is about to happen. So when it does, that sort of totally disrupts whatever is going on because the, um, the employees then need to put the total focus on the emergency at hand. We never know what is going to happen. In other words, it could be an automobile accident, it could be a cave-in, it could be a fire, it could be a heart attack, it could be a drowning, it, it could be any number of, of kinds of emergencies that occur. So our people, I think, are always in a state of apprehension. They're, they're wondering what is going to happen. And I think that's part of the, the stress that goes along with all emergency services, not only the fire department, but police and others. Eric Proctor is a cardiac rescue technician. He operates the chase vehicle, which is usually called out on all medical emergencies, including heart attack and vehicle accident victims. In 1988, Eric Proctor was named Howard County's Career Firefighter of the Year. The, on, the only downfall of this job is the waiting. Okay. It's the waiting. It's just like you never know when those tones are going to hit. You don't know whether it's like, should I go take a shower now or should I wait? As soon as you get in the shower, bingo, the tones go off and you got to rush, you got to dry off. And, <laughs> and uh, that's probably the, the waiting. That's it. It's the, the real, is what I have a problem with. Eric Proctor is an example of a new firefighter. He joined not because of a family member or fantasies of being a hero, but to help other people. The first in his family to join the fire department, Proctor didn't know what to expect when he began living at the fire station. I mean, this is a job where you know everything about your coworkers, and I do mean everything. The only other person besides you that knows more about a particular individual is their wife or significant other and not many other jobs that you can that you can go to that you actually know everything about your supervisor what makes him tick which buttons to push um, uh, which side of the bed he gets up on you know what his all his his whole regimen in the morning he, he, it's it's really it's fun I like it it's, it's it is it's interesting it's very interesting the work and the lifestyle of a firefighter can affect the normal environment of a home Chief Deputy Martin Lapore is aware of the fun and sometimes strain within a firefighter's family. He remembers nights when his father left to go out on calls. Now a father himself, he relays the necessity of his job to his two sons and wife of 20 years, Carol Lapore. I regret that he's not here with the family as much because they're growing up so fast. That's the only thing that I really get upset over. Mostly it's like, you know, our oldest son is almost 18 and I feel like well, oh, Marty's been in the fire service, what, 19? Since 1970. And I feel like he has not been here that much to see some of the things. That's my biggest thing. For about 10 years straight, Thanksgiving, it was me and the kids and either his family or my family, but he was at work. It just seemed like he never, you know. And they all said, I wonder where the turkey's at. Oh, <laughs> oh he's at work. Oh, that's where he is. Oh. 
Fire service in the Lepore family has now spread to their eldest son, currently a volunteer firefighter at the Savage Station. The dangerous aspect of the job must also be recognized by parents as well as spouses. You realize there's dangers in every job. I mean, you could, like Marty said, well, I could sit in an office and, you know, work in a government office and have a heart attack and die. So what's the difference as being out fighting fires? So I said, oh, wow. When you look at it like that, he's right. So go to it. Career families don't have a monopoly on the strains that are felt by being involved with a fire service. The homes of volunteer firefighters have an equal amount of stress. The president of Howard County's Volunteer Firemen's Association is Richard McCauley. The toughest part of being a volunteer is your family relationship. Uh, it's difficult to explain to my wife as we're sitting down to eat a dinner that she's taken an hour to prepare that, sorry, my pager just went off and I have to get up and leave you and our company. Um, holidays, it's difficult for family to understand why I would want to get up and leave them. Uh, my wife had a hard time in the middle of the night for me to crawl out of bed and leave her without her knowing what time I'm coming back, if I'm coming back. Uh, those are the hardest parts. To avert some of the strain that is felt, some spouses become volunteer firefighters or active members within community organizations. Edward Burnich, a volunteer deputy chief at the Ellicott City Station, has been married for a few years. His wife Darlene helps him on the fire ground as a member of the fire station's ladies auxiliary. It does become strain, like I said, because of the amount of time that you spend at the firehouse. But you try to balance that out equally as, as much as well. Uh, plus, not only you know work in the firehouse, but I attend uh, community college one night a week, and that kind of adds to things. The similar lifestyles of both career and volunteer reflect equal dedication when responding to emergencies. Once the alarm goes off, we're firefighters responding to a call. The purpose is to go and provide the service the best we can, and I'm satisfied that we do that the best we can. They'll, they'll come in the station, they'll do what they can, and they can leave when they can. Okay, I can't leave. I'm here for the duration. When I come here, I'm here. But uh, I think the dedication is still there in both, okay, career and volunteer. Training both career and the volunteers, you work as a team. Uh, we're very strong together. We don't, uh, we don't direct ourselves in uh, individual directions. Uh, it helps you when you're working on the scene of a fire or an accident. Everyone knows each other. Uh, we get along personally real well. Uh, basically what it says is that when we're on the call, we can respond and we can work quicker together. We know exactly what the other team's doing. Uh, Basically, uh, the focus is the quicker rescue, the quicker the fire is put out, the quicker the person gets to the hospital. It basically affects the public that they're getting the best service for their dollar. The emergency calls in the middle of the night may bring together both career and volunteer firefighters. It is the remembrance of the most traumatic of situations that bind them together. The sights, sounds, and emotions of a call sometimes never go away. Being handed a, a small child, a two or three year old child that had been run over by a vehicle uh, and uh, uh, performing CPR on the child when it was grossly obvious that the, the child uh, uh, was not, uh, 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 not going to be saved. And, and this is back in the swoop and scoop days and uh, uh, when Howard County General Hospital was not there. And I just remember going to the closest hospital, St. Agnes at that time, uh, by myself uh, in the back of the ambulance. And, uh, the 15, 20 minutes it took to get there was uh, an eternity. These guys end up putting the car airborne and end up uh, striking a tree sideways and impacting the roof on top of them with the vehicle still on its side. And that was a uh, like a four-hour rescue that it took to get them out. As I had the unfortunate situation of managing and commanding a fatal accident, and the accident involved the wife and son of one of uh, one of my personnel and the unfortunate thing was that 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 individual also arrived on the scene in fire apparatus and I had to be the one to tell him that this was his wife involved uh, it was a very difficult situation at best and I hope I never have to go through it again cardiac rescue technician Eric Proctor was two years out of the training Academy when he arrived at the scene of a head-on collision 
A drunk driver had crossed the center line and struck a mother and her son. When I saw this lady, I, I know I must have, I, at least I feel like I froze because she was so traumatized. She, there was a hole in the middle of her head and all just about looked like everything was broken. This lady was alive. Her eyes were open and she was looking at me and I'm telling you, I can close my eyes and I can still see those eyes looking at me and, I, and they were, t it was just like they were talking to me. It was like, help me. You gotta help me, I'm dying, do something. And I did everything I could. I did, I exhausted every emergency medical procedure that I've been trained to do. And um, she died and so did her uh, son. Firefighters and rescue technicians know that when they're called upon, they are responding to a summons when things are going wrong. Some calls, similar to the one Eric Proctor responded to, can and do cause emotional problems. Commander Donald Howe has seen similar traumas. He hopes by passing on to fire station crews what he has experienced to help them better cope with the stresses of the job. Uh, we are told to you know, stick it out, tough it up. Uh, uh, firefighter you know, doesn't show emotions, uh, you'll, you'll get over it. Uh, that, that's, not, that's not a realistic approach. Uh, as I say, we're all human beings. We have emotions. We, we need to vent certain things. And uh, I think years, years past, uh, it's sort of a, a question of uh, how a lot of survived in the system, not being able to vent, not being able to talk about uh, some of the things that we've seen. Uh, we are very fortunate uh, that uh, Dr. Jeff Mitchell, who is currently uh, teaching over at the University of Maryland Baltimore County campus, has developed a program known as the Critical Incident Stress Debriefing Program. Critical Incident Stress Debriefing is a process which helps firefighters to recognize and then talk about the stresses of the job. Dr. Jeffrey Mitchell, being a former volunteer firefighter himself, has helped numerous career and volunteer firefighters and has first-hand knowledge of what these men and women go through. It's not only death and injury, it's responsibility for the life and safety of other people that way is very heavy on emergency personnel that they personally, by decisions they make, by actions they take, uh, may have an influence on somebody else's life. And, that, you know, it's hard enough to deal with your own life and your own responsibilities. And to have this job, you basically take on the responsibilities of other human beings. Dr. Mitchell's stress debriefing has been successful in reversing premature retirement by some firefighters. The realm of the program has been expanded to include fire recruits. According to Dr. Mitchell, he believes that the newest members of the fire department must realize the job they have and the traumatic situations they must command. Excessive stress has the potential to harm them physically, emotionally, cognitively, in their family life uh, can have some damaging effects. We want them to be able to recognize some of the basic common signs and symptoms of stress and to be able to know some of the basic things that they can do to help mitigate the impact or lessen the impact and what things they can do to protect themselves and to help them stay healthy um, and um, really what they can do in terms of a team effort like if there is a stress when do you call for help when do you know that you're in over your head maybe this is a little little bit more extraordinary event than, you're, than they're used to handling i really had a rough time and i had to go through some stress debriefing but um, fortunately my supervisor he recognized, because he didn't run the call, but when I came back and talked about it, just from hearing me talk, this guy needs help. I'm going to get him help. And I got it. And um, I'm, I'm great now. I I'm, haven't had any um, ill effects. But I know how to handle the stress situations now and the critical calls. That's what I learned. I learned to talk about it. I need to talk about it. And that's the important thing. Calls can come at any time of the day but the emergencies can result in a happy ending. Jennifer Elizabeth Paul was six weeks early when it came time to be born. It was a first for everybody, John and Marcy Paul, and medical technicians Herman Ford and Steve Watts. I was ready to push and have the baby come out, but I didn't want that to happen until the guys came. So as soon as I heard the sirens, that's when I, I was like, wow, this is good. <laughs> now everything can come out. It was, a, it was a good thing that they, they made it. As soon as we heard the sirens, I was on the phone with the uh, with the doctor, and he was trying to tell me how to deliver the baby then, and there was no way I could have made it through this. And John said, no, I hear the sirens, okay, they're here, I don't have to do this. No. Customary with all emergencies of this type, 
Howard County's Fire Department hands out stork awards to its members who successfully deliver babies. Maybe next time we can at least tell mom we delivered one before instead of like last time. <laughs> no. Yeah. Tell you that Native, we're nervous in anything. Our faces <laughs> had fear written all over our face. To respond and resolve all emergencies has been the purpose of the fire service since the department started with a single stall firehouse and a horse-drawn ladder wagon. With 10 fire stations and more planned for the future, the fire department continues to keep its promise to the citizens. Service for others, a motto instilled in all who make up the Howard County Fire Department. But what personal satisfaction do you get out of working for the county's fire department? Helping to improve the quality of life of our citizens. If, when you go out to our individual fire stations, you will see working conditions that, uh, that you, you, you might be jealous of because they are good. Our people live at the fire station for 24 hours. So that's really their home away from home, and they make it as good as they want or they make it as bad as they want. When we, when we go through uh, some of these items, uh, see some of these things, experience some of these things, uh, probably one of the first images in your mind is that uh, uh, after you reflect on things, it just seems to be very hopeless. And the reality is it is not hopeless, there is hope. It is, uh, it is the satisfaction of coming back, coming back off a call and, and knowing that, that we made the difference between life and death or uh, uh, destruction of property. The overall advantage of being a part of it, of being able to say, yeah, I was there and I helped, uh, the satisfaction that you get is the biggest advantage that I can explain. It's a lot of work. Uh, a lot of friendships are, are built upon uh, different things that you go through. You will trust you know, career guys as well as volunteers. Uh, so a trust that's built through that organization that you can carry on to anything that you want to do or possess from, from here on in life. Please use your remaining heartbeats wisely and not waste a single precious one.